Hi everybody, it's Celebrate Recovery Cedar View in Newmarket, Ontario, Canada. This is our and via time machine, it's July the 20th, 2020 when this is premiering. My name is Janet and I am a grateful believer in Jesus and Jesus and I have been working on anxiety. All of us at Celebrate Recovery here is we really miss everybody and we really appreciate calls, texts, comments, sharing, so that we can keep connected one way or another un until all of this virus nonsense is over. So coming up in just a moment, we have your Celebrate Recovery worship team recorded a little while back. And so enjoy that worship song. Sing along if you remember the words. And after the song, Jonathan is teaching and it's quite a lively topic. Sit up straight, fasten your seat belts because the topic is who's running you or what worldview are you operating from? Christ or the culture?
Good evening. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, and I celebrate recovery from hopelessness and despair, and I'm working on issues of pride and stubbornness, and my name is Jonathan. It's a pleasure to be here with you this evening, and we have a big subject matter tonight. We're going to talk about Christ versus culture. It could also be called Christ versus chaos, because you've probably noticed that the world at large has a lot of things going on right now. There's a lot of division, a lot of upheaval, a lot of conflict. And just before we get into the subject matter, let's just bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us, that you want the best for us, and we thank you that you give us the opportunity to glorify you in our lives when we surrender our lives to you. We pray this evening as we explore this subject matter that uh, you will speak through me I thank you for your Holy Spirit that can guide me and, and shape the message as we share it together. And may you speak into the heart of each man and woman who's watching. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I mentioned, we live in a time of upheaval and difficulty. And when we think of Christ versus culture, there might be a lot of things that come to mind. One of the things I'm going to mention to you, by the way, is that there may be some things I share with you and say this evening that will irritate you a little bit or get you stirred up or get you annoyed. And if that happens, that's okay. In fact, I think it's probably a good idea because I want to challenge your beliefs. I want to challenge your thoughts about how you live and how you relate to the culture around you and how as a Christian, this, you should be informed about how to think about these things. So these two worldviews that I want to talk about are quite different. One is the secular human worldview, and it believes that you're in charge of your life, that your happiness and your fulfillment are really the me where you find meaning and purpose, and that this physical realm, this physical world, is the ultimate reality, and that your group or tribe or your race or your ethnicity is very important. The other worldview is the Christian one. And in the Christian worldview, we believe that God, through His Word, is the ultimate authority. That your purpose in life is to glorify Him. And we're going to talk more about that later on. And that the unseen, or the spiritual realm, is the ultimate lasting one. And for Christians, it also means that we are all one in Christ Je Jesus. It is a worldview of unity of love, of peace. So where does worldview show up? Well, it shows up pretty much everywhere in, in the actions you take and, and the behaviors you, you show in your life. But there's some really specific and rather extreme examples of this that I know of personally. A young man I know started university at University of Toronto. In his very first day of classes, he went to an early morning philosophy class, and the professor got up and said, if you are a Christian and you are in this class, I want you to know that I believe you have an inferior intellect, and my goal and objective in this class is to disavow you of that idea. That's a worldview showing up, isn't it? Someone told me that their child had been home for the weekend playing with his older sister and went off to school on Monday and told the teacher that he was having fun with his older sister wearing each other's clothes. He dressed up like a girl, and it was lots of fun. The teacher contacted the parents and said, I think your son has a gender identity issue. That's worldview, and it's not the Christian one. This happened to us recently. We were out on a walk one evening, and we noticed a poster on, the, on a pole near a bus stop in our little town, and it was a pro-life poster. 24 hours later, when we walked by the same place, that poster had been torn and ripped and defaced. That's a worldview that somebody was acting from. A con two conflicting worldviews colliding. So, who is the ultimate authority in your life? Well, for the Christian worldview, it's very clear. The Bible talks a lot about the authority of Scripture and the beauty of it, and that's one of the ways that God speaks to us. When we believe that God is the ultimate authority, we find out His will for us through 
Scripture. And I have a, several Scriptures I'd like to read that indicate that. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God, I'm sure the woman is included here as well, may be competent, equipped for every good work. That's a very powerful and beautiful Scripture. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. In other words, the physical is transient. It decays and dies, but the Word of God lives forever. Psalm 19, 7 through 11 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them there is great reward. So in that scripture, it talks about the beauty and the power and the majesty and the authority of scripture. And it also talks about how rewarding it is when we follow the Lord's precepts. Psalm 119 verse 93 said, says, I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Isaiah 48, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. And that reminds me that these two worldviews are like flowers. You might say that the human cultural worldview is rather like a bunch of cut flowers. They look beautiful when you first get them on the table in the vase, but after a few days, they wither, fade, and die. The flowers that symbolize our relationship with God and the Christian worldview are like a potted plant, one that you can take and put in a garden, and it flourishes and grows and lasts long, long after the other ones are dead. Psalm 119, 114 says, You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. So all of these scriptures talk about the value, the importance of the word of God. And as I've read these and talked about them a bit, I've given you a glimpse into the worldview that I believe, the lens through which I perceive the reality of the world around me. You might say it's like a GPS to guide me and direct me in the way that I'm supposed to go forward in my life. And I pray it's your worldview too. And when I use the world, word worldview, let's define that a bit. I'm referring to the beliefs that you hold that help you make sense of the world. As I said earlier, it's the lens you use to look at things. And as you look through that lens, it determines, do I believe in God or am I an atheist? Or what's my sense of purpose or meaning? Or what's important? What do I prioritize? What do I think of as being true and untrue? What are my beliefs about morality, about relationships, about things that are What's important? And you've probably noticed that there are lots of places where your perceptions are very different from another's. Let's take a couple of humorous examples. There's an old joke that says that when a woman asks her husband to do something, she doesn't have to keep reminding him every six months. He's going to do it. Well, that's, that's a silly joke, but it points out a difference in worldview. Another one was a t-shirt I saw recently. The man had this t-shirt and it said, my wife says I'm bad at two things. I don't listen and something else. And while these are rather amusing or funny, they make the point that we as men and women sometimes see things differently. And it demonstrates that there can be differences in perception and how we think of reality. Well. These are just mundane examples and silly ones, but when it comes to a major worldview, we're talking about something larger, more profound, more significant and important than the simple differences between men and women. We're examining reality 
and how we perceive it on a large scale. So let's dig a little deeper into the Christian worldview and then the human secular worldview. The Christian worldview has some very specific beliefs. It, we believe that there is an all-knowing, omnipotent, omniscient God, and God is the sustainer of everything. He created mankind and all of the universe. He created us in His image, and He is the sustainer of everything. We believe that truth is objective and absolute. We know God and find fulfillment through His creation. In other words, we see it in the physical universe. We see it in His Word. We see it and experience it through our personal relationship with Him, which includes our reading the Bible in being in prayer and with our community of believers. It might be at Celebrate Recovery, our church community, our small groups, um, Christian brothers and sisters that we meet with from time to time. We also recognize and believe that God's Word is the ultimate authority. We view the culture that we live in through the lens of Scripture. So if I'm reading something or hearing something or know about something through the Internet, I put it through the filter of God's Word. We believe that God's Word, as I said, is the objective truth. And to be a Christian means to have a personal relationship with God through His Son Jesus, who is God incarnate. And that indicates that as Christians we have confessed our sins, we've repented, we've turned ourselves around, we've accepted the gift of salvation that comes from the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And here is something that's really very important about this worldview. The purpose of life is to glorify God, to love Him, to serve Him, and to know Him. The spiritual or unseen realm is the ultimate reality. It's the one that lasts. We also believe that human beings are intrinsically sinful that since the fall. That we need a Savior. We cannot be redeemed by our own devices or behaviors. I could add more to this, but I think you've got the basic gist of it. The Christian worldview accepts and embraces the primacy of God. We live to glorify Him. And so what does it mean to glorify God? To glorify God means to serve Him, to praise Him, to thank Him, to offer ourselves in how we live our lives as a sacrifice to Him. I think of how people have glorified their country, let's say at the Olympics, where an athlete might stand up and, uh, on the podium after winning an, a medal, and they say he's glorified his country. Or a soldier who, say, who, who runs into a firefight and, and saves a buddy and, and saves his life. That's, he does that for country and for his flag and for his friend. That would be to glorify his country. So glorification really is more of an action than just words. But our actions of praising God and serving one another are the purpose of our life. We are here to do that. But there is an opposing worldview that creeps into our daily experiences. And you've noticed it, as have I. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4, in verses 1-6 to and 16-18 to reminds us, uh, in a way, of the two basic worldviews that exist in opposition to one another. And that the Christ, what the Christian's responsibility is in this. The Christian worldview, as I said, glorifies and worship God, worships God, but the secular human worldview worships humankind, and it's all about self-fulfillment. So listen for these two in these verses. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, which means to, is not understood in some way, it is veiled to those who are perishing. 
In their case, the God of this world, and here Paul is referring to the devil, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, which is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self, that's the physical body, the physical world, is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction, which would be persecution, limits, difficulties, COVID-19, riots in the street, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. So you see in that Scripture how Paul is talking about the importance of the unseen realm, of the spiritual realm, of the Word of God. The overarching secular worldview world is something that we'll call secular or human secular culture. And you can see how it contrasts in that Scripture. As we think about a culture that thinks only of really what's happening in, in the physical realm and might think of the mental or spiritual realm very superficially, we need to define some of its basic beliefs. The secular worldview has beliefs that humans are made to live life as one sees fit. Humans are the pinnacle of evolution. There's a whole other side trip we could go on to for another day. Human beings find fulfillment through self-actualization and personal achievement. My feelings and personal preferences are the authority in my life. The purpose of life is to achieve, enjoy, feel good, and do whatever I can to find happiness. In this secular view of the world, truth is frequently relative. My truth for me, your truth for you. It's rather like eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. So the physical world is the ultimate reality. It's finite, so enjoy it because it'll soon be over. Human beings are born good. That's the secular worldview. If problems occur, it's the result of upbringing, trauma, societal failure, victimization, somebody else did this to me, discrimination, and so on. And the only way to solve this is through therapy and taking lots of seminars and political action that other people do. And those are the things that can solve the problems. So there's these two conflicting worldviews. But here's another big difference between the two. Christians believe that the fundamental problem in life is that we are sinners. We are all sinners. And we need an external solution, a Savior. So it's an inner problem, I am a sinner. It's an outer solution. Reminds me of that old hymn, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. It's an outer solution. The secular human culture view is that the fundamental problem in life that all of the fundamental problems are external. They happen out there. They happen to me. What's been done to me? Who's been unkind to me? What has my family been like? What, what traumas occurred? There's these outer problems, and the only solution is that perhaps through therapy or counseling, I'll come up with an inner answer. It's an inner solution. And the song that goes with that is, I've got to be me. Some of you maybe remember that old song. Notice that there are some huge conflicts and differences in these worldviews. Different operating systems. One is, I have an inner problem and there is an outer solution in Jesus. Versus, I have an outer problem, I'll find my own solutions. That, by the way, is a house made of straw. 
Think about how these differences can determine the outcomes in your life depending on which operating system you're working from. By the way, have you ever worked on one of those big jigsaw puzzles like 2,000 pieces or something like that? If you've got a puzzle with 2,000 pieces and you dump all of the pieces out onto the table, you don't just throw away the box, do you? Well, why not? Because there's a picture on the top of the box. It's a map of the finished puzzle. It's, you might say it's the worldview for that puzzle, and it helps you see how a small piece fits into the big scheme of things. So to your worldview, helps you fit situations, difficulties, obstacles, uh, successes, opportunities, and conflicts into the bigger picture of your life. Well, you might be thinking, well, Jonathan, some of the things that you talk about in the secular human worldview seem kind of sensible. You know, it's nice to talk to a counselor sometimes to figure things out. But that's not what I'm talking about. As I've been preparing this lesson, praying, reading, thinking about this topic, I'm aware, first of all, that it's a huge topic, so you probably will hear more about this from me in a few weeks. But I also am aware how easy it is for me to slip into a secular worldview, because it's all around us. I'd like to think that my priorities, sometimes when I'm being stubborn or prideful, are more important than yours, or God's and that my preferences and feelings should govern my choices in life, and that if I don't like something or someone, I can discount it or them just out of hand. The fact is, however, that the secular worldview is dangerous, it's insidious, and at its very worst, it is evil. Our willful human nature leads us to making compromises, and it's a very slippery slope. If you examine it really closely, At its worst, the secular human cultural worldview is about separation, victimization, pride, selfishness, bigotry, and otherism. And what do I mean by otherism? Well, it's a term I heard uh, J. Warner Wallace, the wonderful Christian apologist, use recently. And he, we are, we seem designed as human beings in this fallen world to look for differences and, and to be bigoted or, or somehow prejudiced against others. It's my siblings and me against you and yours. This side of the street against that side of the street. This side of the tracks against that side of the tracks. This skin color against another. My team against your team. This ne- ethnic group against that ethnic group. Even in the church, this denomination against that denomination. And I think sometimes God must get really frustrated particularly with us Christians. So this is something we do right from childhood. So let's look at a whole bunch of differences that the world looks at and focuses on. I'm black, you're white. I'm conservative, you're liberal. I'm Republican, you're a Democrat. I'm poor and you're rich. I'm a victim, and you're an oppressor. I'm smart and informed. You're ignorant and stupid. This is mine. Keep away from it. Jews, whites, blacks, aboriginals, Christians, choose the group of your choice, are nasty or evil or bad or oppressors or good or saintly. My group is better than your group. Black lives matter. All lives matter. Blue lives matter. What's the matter here? The current culture separates us into identity groups, and I used the term intersectionality earlier, and I'll be talking about that in the next teaching about this. You get the idea. This is not what the Bible promotes. It's what the world promotes. Read the paper, The internet, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. I heard somebody say recently they should put it all together and call it one thing, you twit face, and then we'd have just one internet thing to do, one social media. But the Christian worldview promotes something quite different than that. The Christian worldview promotes togetherness, oneness, harmony. Listen to what Scripture tells us. In Micah 6, 8, 
the prophet writes, What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? That's what God requires of us. To do justice, so justice has action. To love kindness, to be kind to one another, and to walk humbly with your God. And I think that it's fascinating, this word justice, because if you think of it in biblical terms, the word justice is associated with God being the example of justice. He is the standard. The standard for justice is God's righteous judgment. And so if there is something that is unjust, we know that it's sinful. The opposite of justice is sin. But we sometimes hear about economic justice or eco ecological justice or gender justice or social justice or racial justice. But if God is the standard of justice, we don't need the adjectives. Justice is the ultimate justice. I know that sounds kind of funny, but it's, it's true. What is just doesn't need to be defined with other adjectives. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like unto it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. How's that for a verse that promotes togetherness and harmony? It doesn't leave any room for separation, does it? And by the way, who is your neighbor? Is it just that nice little old lady who lives next door? That pretty teenager who always says hi as she walks by and waves her hand? No, actually the neighbor is anyone else who exists in the world other than you. They're your neighbors. James 3, verses 13 to 16 read, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false in the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. Notice it, which worldview that comes from. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above, in other words, from God, is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's pretty clear, isn't it? James points out the difference between these two kinds of wisdom. The earthly one is unspiritual, demonic, selfish, jealous, vile, so, and so on. But the godly wisdom is pure, it's peaceable, it's merciful, it's gentle, it's impartial. There is a very important distinction in these scriptures, and maybe you've picked up on it. Notice that there is always a primary reference point in a belief system or a worldview. And who is the reference point? Well, in the Christian one, in the biblical one, it's God. Our Bible is full of these sorts of statements that I've just read. And the reference is always God or Jesus or the Spirit or the Lord or the Word with a capital W. The non-Christian culture we live in focuses not on God, but on humanity and frequently oneself. It's a me, 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 me culture. We live in a world of selfies, self-promotion. Again, see all the social media uh, platforms. You, you get the idea that they can be very disruptive. And while they can be used with, uh, with some attention and intention to promote the gospel and other positive things, have you noticed just how much rubbish there is on social media? And how how actually unkind and, and disruptive it can be? Ask yourself, are the primary messages committed to building relationships? Are they to tear down or insult or create division or to puff someone up? In my observation, those negative things are frequently the case. 
So let's think about this for a moment. What is the glaring difference between secular human culture and Christianity? Well, first of all, and most importantly, the Christian worldview is Christ-centered. The secular human one is, at its very core, idolatrous. It idolizes the self, human endeavor, ambition, self-promotion, pleasure at all costs, idolizing the environment, it idolizes social movements, it idolizes political parties, it idolizes all sorts of things related to sexuality and gender, and the list goes on and on. It idolizes certain kinds of music and art and, and some things that, are, are, as a Christian, I find despicable and disgusting. Humanity, according to this worldview, the secular human culture worldview, is that humans are at the pinnacle and we are here in the physical realm and our desires and wants take top priority. At its, at its extreme, this worldview says, I can do what I want. I can have sex with whomever and as many as I want whenever I want. I can party to my heart's content. I can take advantage of other people in business or in uh, pleasure. I idolize sports stars or movie stars or politicians or political parties or music musicians or even the Kardashians. It's also about what I can get away with. I've heard people say, doesn't matter what I do so long as I don't hurt anybody. Or, what do you mean? We're both consenting adults. Or, if nobody knows, what's the problem? I was working in an office that was related to the government some years ago, and uh, this guy came in one day asking for some help with the uh, CRA, with the tax department. And when I got the story out of him, he said, well, you know, the tax department wants to charge me uh, tax on $28,000 I allegedly stole. And I said, well, hold on. You know, uh, I can talk to the tax, tax department on your behalf, but I said, when you say you allegedly stole it, I mean, only you would know. Did you steal it or did you not? And he looked at me and without blinking an eye said, that remains to be seen in a court of law. Well, that to me is a rather ludicrous and extreme example of the as cultural humanistic worldview at its very, very worst. It is that somebody's going to tell me, if I get caught, then I did something. But if I don't get caught, I'm okay. And I, I couldn't get that story out of my mind for the longest time. These kinds of views demonstrate the self-serving idolatry of humanistic secularism. It excuses sinful behavior because in our modern culture, notice that sin is a dirty wor word, and it's actually an old-fashioned idea. I've heard people say that. Our Christian worldview, however, is significantly different. As Christians, we recognize the beauty of God's creation. We see it in nature, in human life, both born and unborn, I might add. We see it in human sexuality and its natural and godly expression in the sanctity of marriage. We recognize that God made us male and female. We recognize that there is one race, the human race. We see social and political issues for what they are, human constructs that can, if properly used through a lens of Scripture, and what God wants to promote more godly actions in the world. We recognize that we, you and I, have sinful natures and we're only redeemed and free because of Jesus' sacrifice. We thank God that all of creation is designed to glorify Him. From the majestic mountains you might see driving through the Rockies to a newborn baby. From a great symphony to a child's drawing made for parents or grandparents that gets hung on the fridge. From the love of a parent for a child to the love of the Creator for all of us. Because of God's mercy and His grace, 
We can find joy in this physical world by surrendering to His will, living for Him, knowing what He wants by studying His Word, and looking forward to eternity with Him. And that, that's an amazing, amazing thing to think about. Now let me be honest with you here. I confess I've succumbed at times to the idolatrous worldview. I've harbored resentment towards other people. I've envied the financial success of some or the physical prowess on the playing field of others. I felt puffed up and self-important sometimes, smarter than many and smug about it too. I've been too easily hurt and offended and too ready to find fault in others. I've been a modern-day Pharisee, a self-important, puffed-up fool, and none of that comes from the Christian worldview. It comes from over here. Now, does any of what I just said sound even remotely familiar to you? Have you ever fallen into those traps? Those things come from the culture we live in and from our sinful nature. The temptation, and that's the right word, temptation, is to consider the secular culture as benign. Well, it's not really right, but it's okay. We like our stuff and our perks and our pleasures and we like to make our own decisions, don't we? But as Christians, if we believe that life is meant to be lived for the glory of God, we must be on guard against the erosion of our resolve and the weakening of our dedication to the cause of the gospel. If you're a student of history, you'll recognize that cultures change, that they mutate, that they evolve. The primary culture in one country or continent may be significantly different from that in another place. However, while I am speaking primarily about our current experiences here in North America, many of these same principles apply across cultural lines in other parts of the world and throughout history. Let's make it really simple. Any ideology, ideology or worldview that does not recognize that God is our source and that He is the sustainer, and that salvation comes only from repentance and the acceptance of a relationship with Jesus. Anything other than that is idolatrous and sinful. And I've heard people say, well, they're so nice in that other religion. It doesn't matter. Yes, they're very nice, but the true worldview, the one that sustains us, that looks into the unseen realm, that is designed to glorify God, includes Jesus and a relationship with Him. Let's think of some of the ways the ungodly worldview, the secular human culture, might show itself. You might be slipping into that idolatrous and ungodly worldview if you read the Bible and while you're doing it, you're trying to fit Scripture into some secular mode, some something you want to justify. Oh, if I just find a scripture, then I can justify doing something that in my heart I recognize is wrong. I know somebody who did this. And uh, there was a man who claimed to be a Christian who met a woman who had some emotional issues. She came from an abusive background. And he used the idea that God is love to talk her into having sex out of marriage because, as he said, well, you know, God is telling me, the Holy Spirit is telling me that you need to have a real experience of unconditional love. That's not what he was trying to get. He was trying to get a sexual, um, some sexual activity. That's vile. It's evil. Or maybe you've used the phrase out loud or to yourself, well, other Christians do this. I know people, so maybe that justifies it. That might be gambling or sex outside of marriage or using certain substances or pornography or gluttony. Say, well, I see other people doing it, so it's okay for me. And we use the excuse, well, I'm not really hurting anyone but myself. But you're grieving the heart of God when you do that. What about people who say, well, that's how business is done these days. So if you cut some corners and take advantage of somebody else, you're slipping into this ungodly, evil worldview. 
gossiping about others when they're absent, but then treating them kindly and just uh, showing yourself to be such a gracious, kind, and loving person when they're present makes you a hypocrite and a Pharisee. Or have you made a big show about the sacrifices you're making for others? Remember, our Christian worldview is not supposed to be about us. It's supposed to be about glorifying God. Another way that we as Christians sometimes slip into that old worldview is to act like a victim. By the way, the Scripture is really anti-victim. In fact, it suggests that we are victors. In Romans 8, and by the way, read the whole chapter, but notice this. It says, if God is for us, who can be against us? That's verse 31. And then there's this wonderful promise. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Notice it didn't say victims. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. That doesn't sound much like we're victims, does it? I'm not suggesting, by the way, that bad things haven't happened to most of us at one time or another. But our victory is in Jesus. Another way you can see that you might be slipping into these idolatrous and ungodly uh, ways of thinking is to use any strategy or plan to negatively divide Christians from one another. This includes by race, by, race, by ethnicity, by age, by gender, by where, they, where somebody lives. Scripture tells us that we are one in Christ Jesus. God must really mourn when He sees us divided. Now, just a little slight side trip here. I just want to make things crystal clear. The Christian worldview and the church has absolutely no place for racism. It is vile and evil and idolatrous. To suggest that one group is somehow better than another based on the color of their skin and how much or how little melanin they have is sinful. It's just, it's evil and wrong. It's also evil and demonic to separate one group of humans from another group from the same race, the human race, by, through anti-Semitism or any other kind of bigotry that comes out of the sinful nature of mankind. It is evil. In Ephesians 2, Paul is talking about how one time Jews and Gentiles were separated, but now in Christ, they are no longer strangers to one another. So let's read a few verses, Ephesians chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So the ones who were far off were the Gentiles. For He Himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, Jew and Gentile, is, is what he's talking about here. He can reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to one spirit and to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And I believe that Paul is talking about the Ephesians, to the Ephesians here that they are the church that we both both Jew and Gentile come together as a dwelling place for the Spirit as the bride of Christ in the church. The Christian worldview requires some things of us. We need to ask, first of all, am I putting God first in every area of my life? Am I reading books and blogs, watching movies and videos, and paying attention to the news, doing all of these through the lens of the Scripture? 
Am I behaving, in other words, doing things in a way that brings glory and honor to God? Do I treat both my Christian brothers and sisters and those who don't yet know Jesus with Christ-like compassion and love? This includes in traffic, by the way. If someone who doesn't know the Lord saw me interacting with my family, friends, or colleagues, would they wonder what makes me different than they are? And would that be a positive question? Is there anything in how I live my life that moves me away from my brothers and sisters in Christ in the oneness we are to have in Jesus? And if so, what am I doing with God's help to correct it? Am I endeavoring to spread the gospel, the good news, to family, friends, colleagues, not only through my actions, but all through, through the words I use? I want to close with some scripture from Colossians chapter 3. And I'm going to read it, but I'd like to ask you to also go back and read it for yourself. It's a really important piece of scripture, and it talks about our oneness and, and the importance that we have in unity with Christ. And it talks a bit about the two worldviews as well, so just listen for that. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these two you once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices, and to put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all in all. And by the way, in the early church, and we don't have time to get into the history here, this was a huge thing because, because in the early church, slaves and free would eat together and worship together. Jews and Gentiles. In fact, the Apostle Paul really took Peter, who had been present uh, right after the resurrection of Jesus. He took him to task for wanting to separate the Jews and the Gentiles. Then the scripture continues, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And this sums it up so beautifully. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's pray. We thank you, God, that you love us and want us to be one in Christ Jesus. We thank you for your Son who died so that that could be possible and that he rose again. We thank you that in the worldview that we follow because we follow you, we recognize that there is no black and white Greek or Gentile or Jew, that we are all one in you. Help us to live that way, to view things through the lens of your word, to be your servants, to glorify you. And we do thank you now and praise you for this time together. I pray that whatever has come out of my mouth tonight will be used to glorify you, God, and that that this will have touched at least one person and it will make a difference in their lives. We pray this in Jesus' name.
Amen.